Hi guys, in this lecture we are going to talk about basic atomic structure and symbolism. When, where we left off last time was a model of the atom that looks something like this, where we have protons and neutrons in this central region of the atom, the nucleus, and electrons around the outside. So what I'd like to do is do a quick recap of these fundamental structures that make up the atom and then move into a discussion of what makes atoms different from one another and the symbolism we use to represent different types of elements. So first up, on a review, all right, I want you to remember that these, uh, the nucleus of an atom contains these two types of pro particles, as I said, protons and neutrons, and the protons have a positive charge, right? And surrounding that nucleus is a much larger volume of space that contains negatively charged electrons. Okay? And so to drive this point home, if we were to take an atom and expand it to the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a single blueberry. So we put that single blueberry right there in the middle of that field. That's the size of that nucleus relative to the entire atom, okay? So the nucleus is really taking up a very small amount of the uh, volume of the atom. And interestingly, the vast majority of the mass of the atom is actually found in that tiny nuclear region, all right? So to put some numbers to this, it turns out that the mass of a proton or a neutron, right, uh, it is about 1,800 times greater than that of an electron. Okay, so in other words, it would take about 1,800 electrons to equal the mass of just a single proton or a single neutron. Okay, and so all of these particles here, protons and uh, electrons here, both of these particles have a charge, an electrical charge, and the magnitude of that charge, uh, given in you know SI units here, coulombs, right, is a very tiny number. And so what we're going to do is define the fundamental unit of charge. And this fundamental unit of charge will be defined here, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. And that will represent the magnitude of the charge of either a proton or an electron. And so if we introduce the fundamental unit of charge, we can just simply talk about the charge of an electron as minus 1 and the charge of a proton as plus 1. Okay, so with that review of the basic building blocks of an atom, we're now ready to answer a very important question, namely, how does one element differ from another? Okay, so it turns out that a given element is defined by the number of protons that it contains, right? So if you look at hydrogen, hydrogen has a single proton right here in the middle, uh, a mass number, therefore, of 1 AMU, and if you compare that to, for example, helium, the second simplest element, helium has two protons, one here and one here, and it turns out it also has two neutrons associated with it as well, okay? So the number of protons, one for hydrogen, right, two for helium, define the, these respective atom types, all right? And we have a, a term, called the atomic number, and we typically denote this atomic number by the capital letter Z, gives the total number of protons in the nucleus. So the atomic number Z essentially maps directly on to a specific atom type, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, whatever you might have, okay? Then the mass number, typically denoted by a capital A, gives the total number of both protons and neutrons, okay? And if you have a neutral element, an electrically neutral element, then you will have an equal number of protons and electrons. And so if you look at our examples here of hydrogen and helium, we see that the hydrogen, which has a single proton, uh, is electrically neutral because it also has just a single electron. Okay? The helium, which has an atomic number of two, two protons, right, also has two electrons and is therefore electrically neutral. So as many of you guys are already aware, we denote these different elements, 
right, using a chemical symbol. So rather than referencing elements by Z, their atomic number, we use a chemical symbol, which is simply an abbreviation, a one or two letter abbreviation that indicates what type of atom uh, we're actually dealing with. So in other words, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, right, between atomic number and a chemical symbol, right? So if you have an atomic number of one, you have one proton, you always have hydrogen. If you have atomic number of two, two protons, you always have helium, so on and so forth for throughout the entire periodic table, okay? And so what we end up doing uh, is, you know, representing these chemical compounds using these chemical symbols. And if we want to be explicit in terms of the number of protons, neutrons, and ultimately electrons, as we'll see shortly, then we introduce subscripts and superscripts around that chemical symbol to denote the amounts of each one of these different types of particles. So the, so the subscript right down here to the left of the chemical symbol is reserved for that atomic number Z. Now, once again, that atomic number gives you a one-to-one -one mapping between chemical symbol and atomic number, so it is redundant information, okay? So sometimes that is, uh, atomic number is left out, okay? A superscript to the left is used to denote the mass number, right, which once again is the total number of protons and neutrons. And then, of course, we have our chemical symbol, which, uh, you know, obtained their names from, uh, you know, a variety of different, uh, you know, reasons. And, you know, that's an interesting reading, uh, you know, in the textbook, if you want to go into that further, where those names come from. Okay, so as I said, the atomic number defines the chemical symbol, right? But what's interesting to note is that the mass number, the number of protons and neutrons, can differ for a given element. And this introduces the concept called an isotope, right? So two or more atoms that have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. And so uh, three common examples of isotopes come from hydrogen, our simplest element. If you have hydrogen, which is just comprised of, of course, always that single proton, so the atomic number is always one there, notice, right? And no neutrons, so it's just H1. There's not a single neutron associated with that proton. Then we have the H1 isotope, and that's just standard hydrogen. The isotope of hydrogen that has a single neutron associated with it, so now our mass number is two because we have a proton and a neutron, proton and a neutron here, that isotope is called deuterium, right, denoted by a D. And if you have two neutrons associated with that proton, you have a mass number of three, and we get tritium, denoted by a T. Okay, so these are all hydrogen atoms because they have a single proton. Okay, so the atomic number is always one, but we end up seeing three different flavors or three different variants of the hydrogen atom, each one comprised with a different number of neutrons, and that is the definition for isotopes. So these are the three isotopes of hydrogens. Now this concept of isotopes allows us to answer one of the first questions many students have when they look at the periodic table. If you look at the periodic table for any given element, the mass is reported as some decimal, right? It's not a whole number, um, you know, number of atomic units, right? It's going to be some fractional value. And the reason for this fractional value is because in nature, there are oftentimes many different isotopes or at least more than one isotope of a given element that is found. And so the mass that's reported on the periodic table is effectively an average mass that takes into account the relative amounts of each and every one of these different isotopes. So let's take a look at an example problem here. So I want you to determine the atomic number and mass number for the chlorine isotope 
with 18 neutrons, okay? So if we go to the periodic table, right, we see that the atomic number for chlorine is 17, is 17. sorry about that. Okay, so the atomic number being 17, all right, and the fact that we have 18 neutrons allows us to calculate A, the mass number, right? We plug in that value of 17 for Z, add 18, and we will end up with a mass number of 35. Therefore, our chemical symbol is chlorine 35 here, where we have a left superscript of 35 to denote the mass number, total number of neutrons and protons, and a subscript on the left denoting Z, the atomic number, which is 17, because we're dealing with chlorine. All right, so another, another example problem here. Let's look at uh, the example of chromium. And we're looking at the chromium-52 isotope, and we want to determine the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. So Z is given for us. We've got the subscript on the left, which is 24, okay? Now, we want to figure out the number of neutrons based on this number of protons, okay? Because the atom is neutral, there must be an equal number of protons and electrons. Therefore, the number of electrons is also gonna be 24. Finally, to determine the number of neutrons, we need to take that mass number, A, which we already found to be 52, right? Because that's what the superscript to the left of the chemical symbol tells us. And then we subtract off the number of protons, 24 in this case, Z, to arrive at the number of neutrons. Okay, with this symbolism down pat, we're now ready to explore the last topic of this mini lecture, which is the formation of ions. So it turns out that ions are, they're, it's a name we use to refer to charged atoms. So if an atom has an imbalance uh, in the number of protons and electrons, okay, so the number in, of protons and electrons is not equal, then there will be a net charge on that atom, and we will call that an ion, right? And we have a special place reserved around that chemical symbol to denote the presence of a charge or the presence of an imbalance in the number of protons and electrons. So we're gonna use a superscript to the right of the chemical symbol to denote the charge. And typically, we will write the magnitude of the charge followed by the sign. So if we have a helium ion where both of the electrons from the neutral helium have been removed, so we have a two plus, uh, you know, a, a, a positive two charge, we write that as helium two plus, okay? Similarly, magnesium two plus would be written as such, okay? Now, if you have a neutral atom, this right-hand superscript will just be left blank. So if you don't see anything up there, for example, if I were to just write helium like this, then it would be an assumed zero charge for this guy. Okay, so with this in mind, let's answer a, a question regarding the counting of electrons for a common ion that we'll see a lot in this course. Okay, we want to look at that ion, Mg2+, magnesium 2 plus ion. So because we're dealing with magnesium, we know from the periodic table that the atomic number is 12. In other words, there are 12 protons. Okay, and as a result, neutral magnesium would have 12 electrons. However, because we're dealing with a magnesium 2 plus, we have an excess positive charge of magnitude two. As a result, we must have two more protons than we do electrons. And so if you subtract off two from that 12, then that means that in this magnesium two plus ion, we only have 10 electrons. 